bless you and thank you this morning. Let me get your attention. Let me gather your intelligent attention to Psalms number 46. Um, scamper down the hymn book of the Holy Writ to number 10, verse 10. Psalm number 46, verse number 10. I declare this is befitting uh, for this morning. When you find Psalms number 46, verse number 10, you'll find these old and familiar words. They're so old and familiar, I'm almost ashamed to preach it. But we'll still continue to evolve and still continue to be relevant in a time that's, that's so disheartening. When you find Psalms number 46, verse number 10, you'll find these old and familiar words. It says, be still and know that I am God. Let's, 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 let's look at that again. Be still, come, and know that I am God. I will be exalted, lifted up among the heathens, those that don't know the Lord, those that don't believe in the Lord, those that don't trust the Lord. If you be still, and if you know that I am God, I will be exalted among the heathens. Watch this. I will be exalted on the earth only if you be still. It does not mean don't march. It, it just means in, in the spirit. It just means if, if you just trust God and know who God is and what God can and will do. Oh, have mercy. He says, I will be exalted among the heathens and be exalted on the earth. But, but then, I'm not going to deal with this, but let's just go to, to the next verse, verse 11 real quickly. Verse 11 says, the Lord of host, of host is with us. The God of Jacob, of Israel, is our refuge. Lord have mercy. That's enough. You may be seated. I want to talk this morning from the subject of solid living in a shattered world. Solid living in a shattered world. How can we have solid living in a shattered world? Beloved, it is important for us to realize this morning that we are living in difficult times. If you were to pull some of the pictures of 2020, Take the color out of the picture and match them up with some of the pictures of 1960. With the exception of a few calls, you really couldn't tell the difference. Many of us have been testifying, and I've seen on social media where our white counterpart says, we have come a long way. And I wouldn't argue with us coming a long way for it because perhaps... We have removed those water fountains that we couldn't drink from. I would argue that you're correct in a sense that we no longer have to go to the back of the bus. I would argue that you are correct because no one is really holding a gun to us. We can walk in the University of Alabama, Auburn, and these other universities. I would argue that correctly we have come a long way. But I would also argue that we still have a long way to go. And if I were to borrow that little song that simply says that the reason he understands is because he was born by the river in a little tent. Songwriter said, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. Watch these immaculate words he uses. It's been a long 
time coming. But I know a change going to come. Now, now, the writer of that little soliloquy, that little song, it appears to me he has to know something about God. Because the God we serve won't just allow things to remain the same. And sometimes, I have to be honest with you, I get frustrated with the movement and the timing of God. Some of you can't do that. You, 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 you're too Christian. You're too, you got it together. You don't have the capacity to do that. But if I want to be honest today, there are times I'm frustrated because God does not show up when I want him to. God does not move when I want him to. God does not handle people the way I want him to. But God is quickly to remind me it's not about me. Because if God just moved on my wants and my appetites and my desires, then God will stop being God. And God is a God of everybody and all things. God just don't move when we want him to. God is so sovereign that God moves when God wants to. And since God moves when God wants to, God is such a God. That, that, that he, he changes things that are going in a certain direction. And sometimes God just not, don't snap his finger and change things. Because if God changed things with the snapping of a finger, then we won't learn what we're supposed to learn. Then we won't move the way we're supposed to move. And God is such a God. God, God reminds me of, my mama reminds me of how God truly is. Because my mama told my brothers and, my, and one of my sisters that, listen, you, you, there's certain things you don't have to do. Now, if you go to jail, I'm going to let you sit there. Now, what kind of mama would let us just sit in jail? Mama said, I'm going to let you sit there and think about what you did. Because if I get you out of trouble too soon, I wish I had somebody. If I get you out of trouble too soon, Israel, if I get you out of the wilderness too soon, you'll forget what it feels like to be in that place. And sometimes when you forget, you'll go back to the same place as the Lord has delivered us from because you got out too quickly. And oh, my brothers and sisters, oh, my African-American brothers, sometimes God will let us fester in some stuff. Sometimes God has to let us simmer in some stuff so that when he brings us out, when he delivers us, we're not in a hurry to go back. But sometimes when God gets us out of stuff too quick, we forget about how dangerous it is, how immoral it is, how, how it's ungodly. And God has a way, does he not, of getting us on the right page and understanding what he's doing. You might not understand it right now. But as granddaddy said, you'll understand it better by and by. How can we have solid living in a shattered world when the ground beneath our feet right now is shaking? How can we have solid living in a shattered world when there's a push to allow abnormal to become normal? In America, it's not normal to kill folk. It's not normal to kill African Americans. It's not normal to turn on your TV and be desensitized to death and still wake up and say we are Christians. It's not, it's not it's abnormal for, for you to see that in the African American community. And just as it is, it's abnormal for African Americans to see the death of white Americans. Because if you are a Christian, then there ought to be something that touched the heartstrings. White or black, you ought to, it ought to touch your heart strings to see little children being kidnapped and raped, regardless of their color. That there ought to be something wrong with, 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 with child pornography and, 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 and sex slaves of our children, white and black. There ought to be something pulling on us that the God on the inside of us, the Holy Spirit, should be pulling on us to say something is not right about that. I'm so grateful today that when I look on the TV channel that, that there's a whole lot of white Americans marching with us to show solidarity. 
I'm glad this morning because the Spirit of God is permanent in the hearts of not only just African American, but the world. And the world is standing up and saying, for God I live and for God I will die. And what I see is not godly. There's this, 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 this phenomenon that's going on. That we must accept the status quo. But God's saying that it's no longer time to live like that. God is bringing us to a new level in Christ that we can have solid living in a shattered world. Let's look at this text today because by the time we get down to this song, uh, that, that the songwriter evidently is living through a time of war. He's living in a time of conflict. Living in a time of personal strife. My brothers and sisters, just like the psalm writer writes, it appears that even in our day, we're living in a time of conflict. Living in a time of strife. Living in a time where there's war, and the war is both pandemic and epidemic. A pandemic on one hand because COVID-19 is killing us, at an alarming work, but then there's an epidemic because there's also, we're losing the life of unarmed black men. And in spite of that, the psalmist still suggests to us today that we can still have solid living in a shattered world when we put our trust in God. Lord, have mercy. Talk back to me if you can. We can still have solid living when we put our trust in a God who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we may ask or think. Listen, this, this conflict that we're talking about today is in this text about this writer shows us that the writer is writing this song. And this song that he's writing is used to encourage the children of Israel to stand in the strength of the Lord. Lord have mercy, we will learn today how we can't stand in our own strength. We have to stand in the strength of somebody who's greater than we are. How we can't trust the government's strength. But we have to stand in the strength of our God. That we can't stand in the extremities of our society. But we have to stand in the polarizing senses of a God who's able to take us to higher heights and take us to deeper depths. We stand in the strength of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The entirety of Psalms 46 is written in the third person to remind us that God is our strength and he's at work in the midst of our struggle. My brothers and sisters, what a struggle we have. What a struggle we're in. And God forbid that there are some of us that are out there that says that they're not a part of the struggle. God forbid that, that somebody thinks that just because of their education, just because of the neighborhood that they live in, just because of, of the the, the, the figures or the zeros that are behind their portfolio, that they are better than anybody else. Let me remind you that whenever your car pulls next to another car and you are pulled over, all they see is not your bank account, not your job description, not where you live. All they see is something that's fit, that they are fearful of. All they see is blackness. Lord, help us. Deliver us from the house mentality. We think just because we're in the big house, that we don't have to worry about those that are in the field. So this psalm, psalmist is writing us, says when we read verse number 10, and that's what we're getting at right now. By the time we get to verse number 10, however, something happens in verse number 10. The point of, of view shifts from the third person to the second person. Instead of the writer writing about himself, the writer instead is writing about the Lord. Here the Lord himself addresses the readers of this song. 
By the time we get to verse 10, the, God himself says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. Don't, don't miss what God is saying. Re whether you do it or not, I will be exalted amongst the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Remind yourself that God does not eat our help to be exalted. God would love for us to lift up holy hands. God would love for us to praise and worship his holy name. But in case we don't give God what he's deserved, God is still going to be glorified. Just because you don't put those hands together don't mean that God won't be lifted up. Because even Jesus says, if these don't cry out, then the rocks will cry out for me. And the rocks don't have to cry out because God has not been good to rocks. God has been good to all of us. And since God has been good to all of us, all of us deserves uh, the right to give God praise and to lift up God's holy name because God is truly worthy to be praised. Let me get a little litmus test this morning. If the Lord woke you up this morning, that's a reason to praise God. If you were clothed in your right mind, that's a reason to praise God. If you had a portion of your health and strength, that's a reason to praise God. If you had clothes on your back, that's a reason to praise God. If you had food on your table, that's a reason to praise God. Every day you wake up, there's something that you can find a reason to give God praise for. Pastor Foster, I hear you, my spirit. How can we have solid living in a shattered world? How, how can we have something solid in a place that's so shattered right now? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. And the very first thing this takes is tailored to teach us today is you can have solid living in a shattered world when you hear the imperative command to be still. Lord have mercy. You can have solid living in a shattered world when you hear God saying to you to be still. Listen, this, this terminology, be still, means rafa, raha. Watch this. Means to, while you're trying to handle it, raha means to drop your hands. Lord have mercy. While you got your hands on the problem, to be still means not that you got to stop marching, not that you got to stop protesting, but you've got to learn that there are some things you got to drop your hands and leave in the hands of God. Raha means to drop your hands, means to, to cast down, to, to let fall. And listen, not that you have to remove your hands, just let your hands fall. Take your hands off of it. Watch what he says. He says to be relaxed, meaning to trust God's hands more than you trust your hands. My brothers and sisters, that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? To in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of epidemic, to trust that God will make a way out of no way, that's a tough thing to do. But beloved, let me, let, me, let me tell you a little secret. All you can do about corona is put on a mask. All you can truly do is stay separated. But, but, but that's just when humanity ends. But you got to know that God opportunity begins. That humanity plays a part, but not only does humanity plays a part, but divinity plays a part as well. And you've got to trust God enough to be still and let God be God. And where you can't stop Corona from slipping in, God has the power to rebuke it and keep it in its place. Even when you can't, you've got to just learn how to be still. There are several interpretations surrounding be still. Regarding whom the Lord is addressing in this text. Because one commentary says that God is addressing the enemy and he tells the enemy to be still. But then there's another translation, another interpretation that says God is not talking to the enemy, 
God is talking to his children. And so now, now what's left up to me to decide or decipher whom the Lord is talking to. And so I just decided that the Lord was talking to both of us. Lord have mercy. I just believe that God has the power to talk to both of us at the same time. Come and lean in. Let me, let me help y'all a little bit. Lean in. So, so let, let me tell you how my mama did it. Whenever one of my brothers got in trouble for doing something, my mama would say, y'all come here. Mama was talking to one brother, but all eight of us was in the room. Lord have mercy. Mama decided if I talk to one of y'all and one of y'all get it, I'm going to have to do the same thing tomorrow. I wish I had a, 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 a. And so Mama decided, I want you to see and hear what's being explained now. It's the same message. I'm directing it at the one that's messing up. But since you're here as well, you don't have to make the same mistake because you are hearing the same command from God. And God is the only one that has the power to talk to your enemy and talk to you at the same time. And just because your enemy don't read your Bible don't mean God can't get them on the same page. Lord, have mercy. But what do you do when your enemy read the same Bible you do? Lord, have mercy. Let me say that again. Some of you missed that. What do you do when the enemy you're discussing Reads the same Bible that you do. <laughs> God says, this is what you do. You got to hear the imperative command of God. And what is the imperative command of God? Be still. What, what does that be still mean? Well, Jesus explains that to us when we, gets over to the, when we get over to the synoptic gospel. Because there was a great storm that came. And when this great storm came, Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. He was asleep. The Bible says that Jesus was asleep. The disciples came running down to Jesus and they were upset and frustrated. They say, Master, carest thy not that we perish? Jesus got up. He got up, watch this, not, that, not so that he could see the storm, but so that the storm could see him. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And when the storm saw Jesus, Jesus says, Peace. Watch the next two words, be still. In other words, Jesus is, um, the psalmist is reminding us is what Jesus said in the New Testament, that instead of running around putting your hair out trying to get water out of the boat, Jesus is commanding us that stop trying to handle it with your hands, drop your hands, and call on God, and God will remove everything that you are trying to do all by yourself. And you won't have to ask God, do you care that we are dying? Just call on him and he'll step in and say, peace, be still. But you've got to hear the imperative command to be still. Be still means you're going to hold your frustration, hold your anger, hold your stresses. Keep your blood pressure down and let God handle it. That while I'm marching and protesting, my frustrations are at ease. I don't have to burn down a building because God got it all in control. I am just a utensil being used by God in my protest. But by the time this thing ends, God's hand will intervene in the affairs of the world. God will take care of it. But first, I have to leave it in God's hands. God has the power to speak one message. And when he speaks one message, it goes to both us and to our enemies. Perhaps there's an enemy today called racism out there. Perhaps there are some Christians today in both the enemy called racism and both Christians are listening to the same God. And God got one message to both of us. Be still. Be still. Be still means drop your hands. Drop your rocks. <laughs> drop your racism. Drop your burning torches. Drop, drop out. Just be still 
And as one, and as one writer says, and see the salvation of the Lord. Not only is there a, here the imperative command to be still, there's something else this text is teaching us as well. Know that there's an intimate relationship reveals your knowledge of him. Watch this. Intimate relationships reveal your knowledge of him. You can't say you know the Lord until you know him intimately. That's why you are pulling out your hair and setting everything on fire. Because you don't know him. Let me be real clear. I am about protesting. I am about, I'm not concerned about builders, but, but I am concerned about how we handle things. The reason I am concerned because above all, I am a Christian. I, I do believe in Jesus Christ. I am a believer. Yes, I am a believer. And when you become a believer, there are certain things you don't have to do when you trust that God is going to take care of it. Watch this. Intimate relationship reveals your knowledge of him. To trust God is to know God. And you can't trust God until you know God. And to know God means we have to surrender our anger, frustration, and stresses to him because we know God is in control. And when God is in control... We know that everything works together for our good. If you trust him. And if you surrender to him. And you can only do that if you know God. Old songwriter, you say, do you know him? Do you know? And then the, the, the response back to that song is, yes, I know. Oh, him. Yes, I know. Yes, I, you, you, you got to be over 40. Don't, even, don't worry about it. You got to be over 40. In other words, songs of old, the old hymn writer would say, do you know Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God? And, and, and then they wanted to know if you know him, because if you know him, your life ought to reflect that you know him. And that you can't say you know God, watch this, and live any kind of way. You can't say you know God and react in the I don't care how much you say you accept my apology. I don't care how much you say you accept their apology. I don't care. When you're steadily trying to destroy and kill and take down, if you are a Christian, your life is now to be reflective of a God that you say that you know. Those of us that know the Lord this morning can trust the true, true intimacy happens. When believers feel safe enough to become vulnerable with God. I got to admit, on last week after hearing it, I woke up this morning, heard something else on the news. I got to admit about four or five o'clock this morning when I got up, I had to become vulnerable with God. Love it as a black man, and as a pastor, and as a former police officer. I had to become so vulnerable to, I had to say this morning to God, God now, that's enough. I had to be vulnerable with God and say, Lord, I'm hurting a little bit. And I had to be vulnerable. I said, Lord, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting over this the way I used to. I'm, I, I'm seeing young black men. Lord, I got black sons and black daughters. Lord, I got black nephews and, and, and black uncles. Lord, 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 this is bothering me. I had to be so vulnerable with the Lord. I had to be honest and truthful. And you can't just run around pretending there will become a time in life where you just got to have a conversation with God and be real with God and say, Lord, I'm hurting. Lord, I need your help. Somebody ought to be able to be vulnerable with God. Not just make positive confessions and just say everything going to be all right because there are times when everything just won't be all right. You've got to talk to the Lord. Tell him all about your trials. Tell him all about your hurts and your pain. Be vulnerable with God. And that's what forms intimate relationships with God when you're not afraid to tell God nothing because you know you won't hear what you told God on the other side of town. What he says, knowing God has the power to create a shift in the atmosphere. 
That's why we intimately tell God these things. Because only God has the power to create a shift in the atmosphere. And when God creates a shift in the atmosphere, God takes into consideration our petition to him and God moves at our behest because God realizes if he is to be exalted amongst the heathen, that he has to show himself proof and worthy through his children. How does a believer believe in God? How does a believer see God? Moreover, how does a believer even know God? An unbeliever knows God through a believer's walk. So how are we walking? How are we showing ourselves to be godly? What, what type of Christians are we when we are saying one thing at church and another thing is on your Facebook page? What type of God are we when we are saying for God I live and for God I'll die, but when we turn on our social media page, there's something different. And God knows I, I dare not be judgmental, but if I'm not going to be judgmental, then you don't be hypocritical. Don't, don't be a hypocrite and claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, but then you're on Facebook calling somebody else something else. Come on, talk back to me if you can. Because when you have an intimate relationship, your walk ought to be that of Christ. But not only is there an intimate relationship, and that reveals your knowledge of God, that we know him, because he says, and know that, in verse 10. But finally, I see something else here. We have to understand the importance of I am. Be still and know that I am. Well, wow, let me say that one more time. He says, verse number 10, be still and know that I am. I'm out of here. Watch this. He says, God has been, in this text when we read it, God has been added to the text. Because in the original writing, it just says, be still and know that I am. But, but according to King James, it says, be still and know that I am God. God has been added to the text so that the reader or the English reader can understand who I am is. But for the members of First African Baptist Church, God did not have to be added to the text because the members of this church know who I am is. Because when Moses was there, Moses was getting ready, I'm out of here, to head down to Egypt. Moses says, God, if I go down to Egypt and I tell Pharaoh that you said to let my people go, Pharaoh is going to want to know who sent me? Ain't the Lord all right? <laughs> well, I just wish that the Lord would send Michael Foster to 1600 Black Lives Matter Avenue to tell the Pharaoh in Washington, D.C. that the Lord says, uh, stop killing my people. Ain't the Lord all right? Well, uh, Moses says, uh, who can I tell the Pharaoh sent me? But God says, tell Pharaoh that I am sent you. Ain't the Lord all right? Uh, and all you got to do when you get down to Egypt is say, Pharaoh... I am sent me. <laughs> Ain't the Lord all right? And I'm glad this evening uh, that somebody in the church house ought to know who I am is. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is a way out of no way. Ain't the Lord all right? Uh, Y'all know who I am is, don't you? Uh, 
I am a lily in the valley. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is the bright and morning star. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is absolute and infidelity and infirmity. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is supernatural and splendid glory. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is distinct and supernatural capacity. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is king of kings and lord of lords. Ain't the Lord all right? Anybody know who I am is? I am is the Alpha and Omega. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is a way out of no way. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is the one that woke me up this morning and started me on my way. I am is the great and morning star. Ain't the Lord all right? I am is the one who's able to do all things but fail. I am. I'm finished. I am. And so, and so just in case there's someone here this morning and you don't know who I am is. I am is just not the God of Israel. I am is the one who is with us. Who's ahead of us. Who's behind us. Who's holding us up on every side. Remember who I am is. He says, be still and know. And I think that's the part right there that we miss. Be still and know. See, see, beloved, when you know, when you know who God is, then, then certain things that, that frustrate us, we could just put it in his hands and take it off our hands. Put it in his care, take it off our care. Trust God, surrender to God and allow God to take care of it and to take care of you. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, you've been so good to us that if we had a thousand tongues, we still couldn't thank you enough. But Lord, we're living in some cruel and unusual times. Lord, we realize that some of us have seen something similar to this back in those early days. But then there's some young folks, Lord, that are struggling. Lord, not only they're struggling with the pandemic, but they're struggling with this epidemic. But Lord, relax their minds. Help them to relax. And the only way that they can do that is they got to know you. And Lord, we pray that they realize that all of this don't fall on their shoulders because there's too much of a burden to carry. But if they would just do their part and trust that God will do his part, then everything's going to work out all right. Lord, we cannot leave you out of the equation because when we leave you out of the equation, nothing happens, nothing moves. There's not a shift in the atmosphere. But because we added you to the equation, because we put you first, we know that all things are going to work together for our good. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.